So it's my honor to introduce our um, graduation speaker. Um, and this is Scott Dietze, who has served as Senior Vice President of Applications at Yahoo. In this role, he helped look after Yahoo Mail, Messenger, Flickinder, uh, Groups, Answers, uh, Zimbra, managing 600 plus person organizations and over $600 million revenue. He joined Yahoo in 2007 with the acquisition of Zimbra, where he was president and CTO. Prior to Zimbra, he was a CTO of BA Systems, where he crafted the technology and business strategy for WebLogic that drove BA from 61 million to 1 billion in revenues. And he came to BA by the acquisition of WebLogic, a pioneer in Java and web application technology. He is also credited with helping put together the J2E standard, launching the web application server category, launching the Java community process, and driving web services with Microsoft and IBM. Prior to WebLogic, he was a Transact, a developer of distributed transaction information sharing systems, acquired by IBM. I guess you notice a pattern there. Start it, have it acquired. Start it, have it acquired. And that's probably useful advice, and he may talk a bit about that. We're proud to call him a fellow Carnegie Mellon family member. He did his PhD, MS in computer science, and bachelor's in applied math and computer science. It's really my pleasure to introduce Scott Dietzen, now entrepreneur out of residence. Thank you, Martin, and thank you, faculty. I am both uh, honored and happy to be here and congratulations to the Carnegie Mellon Silicon Valley class of 2010. As far as I know, I only have one recurring dream. It's a nightmare that goes like this. It's senior finals week, and I've completely forgotten to attend a couple of classes. I've not done the assignments, not taken the tests, and I'm not going to graduate. It astounds me that this nightmare still has the capacity to scare me some 20 years on. Uh, but the good news for all of you is that forevermore you can sigh with relief and roll over and go back to sleep. <laughs> my aspiration for my few minutes with you here today is to share some thoughts on how to have a successful career in technology. And as is my modus operandi, I have a top ten list. The ARPANET is almost 40 years old, the World Wide Web is approaching 20, and yet their impact on the world continues apace. Most of you will not remember how things were beforehand. Uh, if you can, you're getting a bit long of the tooth, like me. I only started programming in college. In those days, we programmed in the middle of the night because it was the only time we could get sufficient cycles that a simple build wouldn't bring our shared computer to its knees. Most of us would sleep through class, or else in class, in order to get the vastly higher productivity we could get in the middle of the night. Consider the contrast. My son, who's now three, has been teaching himself the iPad, a machine with more memory and more horsepower than that refrigerator-sized mini computer that I got my start on. Uh, he has no written language yet, but he has learned how to navigate menus through pattern matching and trial and error. And while he's not programming, he plays with gaming and education applications, has books read to him, and watches videos. Unbeknownst to daddy, he even discovered a mashup of Thomas the Train and rapper 50 Cent. <laughs> And he's now a master of the touchscreen, so much so that he'll walk up to a laptop or a TV and hit it and expect it to do his bidding. <laughs> Why is the TV broken, Daddy? <laughs> Accessibility to computing via these true consumer devices, uh, smartphones and tablets, is going to continue to transform our industry. Helping to make the associated software easy and elegant is going to be one of the best things you can do. In retrospect, we take them so much for granted that it is hard for us to comprehend the simple elegance and dramatic impact of the spreadsheet or the hyperlink or the touchscreen. None of us is likely to come up with anything quite so profound, but each of you has the opportunity to help change the world for the better and to be handsomely rewarded for doing so. When I returned to the other CMU, CMU East, a couple of years ago for a celebration of 50 years of work in computing, happily I'm young enough that I missed the first couple of decades, I, I was startled to hear voice the worry that our discipline was getting boring, that perhaps all the revolutionary work had been done. 
This is silly. I've now been in Silicon Valley for going on 15 years, and I'm convinced that the breadth of, breadth of innovation going on today is higher than it's ever been. Five years ago, venture capitalists weren't investing much in databases uh, or file systems or programming languages. And today, there's exciting work going on. Moreover, the barriers for delivering innovation and technology have never been lower. So to more firmly rebut any silliness about our industry getting stale, I humbly offer a top 10 list of ongoing disruptive waves that will keep computing both exciting and lucrative for the next decade and beyond. Number one, mobile. In the next few years, HTML5 capable mobile devices will trump PCs as the primary internet interface. And sometime thereafter, we will get the majority of humanity online. Number two, blended realities. As we play social games, run, run into friends with some help from Foursquare, compare athletic performance on Strava, or just find a good coffee shop along the way to our destination. We are artfully mixing virtual worlds and good old reality in exciting new ways. Number three, social. In addition to being a new vehicle to interconnect people, social networks are changing the way we deal with information, just as search did before it. Not always for the better, I might add. Who are all these people with nothing better to do than update their Facebook status to eating sushi or going to the bathroom? Number four, cloud. We are stitching together tens and even hundreds of thousands of commodity machines and disks to cost effectively deliver seemingly unlimited computing power. But the software still has to evolve to take advantage of that elasticity. Number five, uh, software as a service. Why should end users have to worry about procuring, deploying, managing, securing, and updating software? Expect software services to get ever more specialized and expect integration to happen, happen at scale between the SaaS providers. Number six, collaboration in the large. That is across organizational, geographic, cultural, and even language boundaries. Wikis and crowdsourcing are transforming content just as open source and agile methodologies transform software. Number seven, big data. We are crunching vast quantities of data in these clouds to improve the user experience of search, social networking, e-commerce, and so on. Like Moore's law, our data footprint is doubling every 18 months, but we are a long way from mining the smarts buried inside that data. Number eight, functional programming and NoSQL. Uh, we are re-exploring functional programming languages, uh, C Clojure and Scala, functional programming models like MapReduce that I learned many, many years ago, and functional data representations, all to make it easier for programmers to deliver massively distributed, massively parallel applications. Number nine, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, like functional programming, AI is making a comeback. More intelligence, particularly machine learning, um, is being incorporated into software to make it better as well as more resilient in the face of change. One proof point I find compelling is CMU's win in the DARPA Grand Challenge. And finally, number 10, ubiquitous computing. Software is finally making inroads in areas that have historically not been well automated, such as medical care or managing the power grid. We are even recasting whole disciplines like astronomy and particle physics as big data problems, wherein we publish so much data that only software can meaningfully digest it. Jim Gray, one of my heroes, calls this the fourth paradigm of science. So that's my top 10 list of disruptors shaking up computing. As you look toward optimizing your own contributions to and rewards from our industry, keep these ways of transformation in mind. It is through their impact that technologies will be made and obsoleted and fortunes won and lost. Consider, there would have been no web logic without the advent of the web, Java, and the free trial download. By empowering every developer to try out our product every day, we were able to push off corporate purchasing until after the applications were built. Today, there is much less shelfware in the world because a business rightly expects to have proven out software before they pay for it. And consider, there would have been no Zimbra without the richly interactive web UI of Ajax, mashups, open source, and the innovative business model of mixing an open source core 
with proprietary extensions, now called open core. Catching one or more of these transformative waves can give the software you write the leverage to change the world, but it doesn't change the fundamentals. Most of all, you need a great product, a great team behind that product, and a set of customers that need your product so badly that they will spend their time and scarce money to adopt it. There is still a staggering amount of mediocrity in software, uh, which means frustration and waste for end users. Talk to your customers and use the web to help them talk to you. They will help you do better. Finally, these top 10 disruptors, especially with all the others that I haven't sorted out yet, are going to remake the tech industry landscape yet again. 10 years ago, Google hadn't made its first dollar from search advertising, Apple had been written off for dead, and Facebook hadn't been born. Our industry stays in this state of flux because of innovation, but also because some of our best thinkers keep getting it wrong. We at WebLogic made one right bet in believing Java would find more of a home on the server uh, than uh, on the client in the browser. The smart money then was on Java clients and C++ servers. But at Zimbra, I was really troubled by the idea of trying to write 100,000 lines of model view controller uh, code in JavaScript and figuring out how to run it inside the browser. And yet, that was probably the best decision that we made. When I first looked at WAP, I rightly scoffed, you know, why try to reinvent the internet uh, for, mo for mobile? But when apps showed up on mobile devices, I poo-pooed them. You know, on the PC, apps had lost out to the browser, and I was even more convinced it would play out that way in mobile, how wrong I was. Keep these failures of prognostication in mind um, as they create an opportunity for you to make contrarian bets and win big. Let me close with a story. Back in the early days of Java, I had the opportunity to represent WebLogic in a backroom debate among the Java powers that be. I made what I thought was a well-reasoned argument. My case was summarily dismissed by one of the Sun representatives who closed his response with, and Scott, just why in the hell would you think that would ever work? I paused, thought, and said, I guess I'm just a blind, stupid optimist. At that point, one of my allies in the debate said laughing, Gee, Scott, I sure hope you don't lose your optimism, because then you're just going to be blind and stupid. <laughs> I can no longer recall what that particular debate was about, but I still laugh about the blind and stupid bit. There's an underlying truth in this story. If you aspire to lead people, and after all, developing software leaders is our mantra here at CMU, undying, contagious optimism is an essential asset. Cultivate it. Just try not to be blind and stupid. As Reagan said, there is no limit to what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Your goal should be to help build teams that work well enough together that you forget who came up with what idea. Perhaps the single greatest thing about our industry is what a small team of bright, passionate people can accomplish. Smartphones, open source, and clouds have dramatically reduced the hurdles to delivering the next generation of software innovation. You just need to come up with a spark. Thank you. Good luck, and Godspeed to the Carnegie Mellon class of 2010.